Welcome to this video. We are going to look at something called plane polarization and Brewster's angle. First, we need to recap what we know about reflection and refraction. Let's say we have some light striking a water surface. On the top here is air, on bottom is water. The light comes in at this angle, like that. The way we measure the angle is by drawing a normal line. Normal means perpendicular. And that line there is perpendicular to the interface between air and water. So we drew our normal, which is perpendicular to the interface. We measure the angle that the ray is coming in along from normal. The incoming, ang uh, the incoming ray we call the incident ray. And what happens to this incident ray? Whoa. What happens to the incident ray? Well, as it turns out, some is going to be reflected like this. And some will be transmitted into the water. The transmitted part doesn't just continue on along this straight line. This incident and the transmitted part is not making a straight line. I've done this wrong. What happens when you enter a different medium with a different refractive index? the light bends. Water has a higher value of a refractive index than air, and so, instead of going straight on, the light bends toward the normal, because n is higher in the water than in the air. So there's our uh, refracted beam right there. Now just as a side note, this angle, the angle of incidence, is equal to this angle, the angle of reflection. This is different. It's been bent, so it's not equal to this angle. Take a look. The angle be between the reflected beam, the angle between the reflected beam here and the refracted beam here is clearly much bigger than 90 degrees, right? Huh, interesting. Well, what if we did something different? Instead of sending in that incident light the way that it, we did on the left side, let's say we do something like this, send it in like this. So when we draw our normal line, right, normal to the boundary, to the interface between the two media, when we draw that line and we mark the angle of the incident ray, it's quite big. So the reflected angle will be equal in size, also quite big. Some of that light is reflected off, some of the incident ray is reflected, and some of the incident light is transmitted into the water. When transmitted, it doesn't just continue on in a straight line, we said. It's bent in toward the normal. So maybe kind of like this. Bent in a little bit. Let me get rid of that other line. This time, and so here's our ref uh, refracted ray. Now, well, let me, let me mark my, my rays. Let me label these. Here's the incident ray. Here's the reflected ray. And here's the refracted ray. Right, refracted. So now the angle between the reflected ray and the refracted ray, what I marked in green right there, is less than 90. It was bigger than 90 here. Now it's less than 90. So you can see where this is going. There is a sweet spot between the two pictures I've drawn where the angle between the ins where the angle between the reflected and refracted rays is exactly 90. Okay. How do we do that? How do we get that angle to be exactly 90? You have to send in the incident beam at just the right angle, not this small, not this big, it's somewhere in between. So let's draw that. I've got my water surface, right? air on top, water on bottom of the line. Here's that perfect angle. Let's see, this was too big an angle, and this, whoops, this was too small, so let me try something in between. Something more like uh, this. 
the incident ray comes in, it hits the surface, the, the boundary, the interface, and it's reflected off at the same angle. This perfect angle, this magical angle, we are going to call it phi. And the angle of incidence, phi, is equal to the angle of reflection. Now at this angle, this magic angle, right, of course some light is reflected, and some of the incident ray is refracted. And at this right, at this perfect angle, phi, the refracted beam, or ray, is perpendicular to the reflected ray. They make a right angle. This angle right here that I just marked, it's pretty easy to show that this angle is 90 minus phi. Okay. If this is a right angle, then right here is 90 minus phi. And if this is a right angle, then right here is simply phi because these add to 90. And because these add to 90, this has to be 90 minus phi in order for this and this to add to 90. Wow, what a mess. If you want to, give it a shot. Prove that. Prove that for yourself. That the angle of refraction is 90 minus phi. Okay, there is something else that we haven't yet been talking about. Uh, which is polarization. We're going to get to it. We're going to see how it relates. But first, first, um, let's just say phi is the angle at which the reflected and refracted rays of light are perpendicular. I'm just going to make a perpendicular sign. Okay, that's what phi is. It's that perfect special angle. So I want to calculate what phi is equal to. I'm going to call the refra refractive index of water n, and I'll call the refractive index of air 1, okay? because it is. The refractive index of air is 1. Snell's law says Let's do n first. It says the refractive index of one medium, let's say water, over the refractive index of the other, let's say air, is equal to the sine of the angle of the ray while in air, while incident, over the sine of the angle when the ray is in water. So if you have water here, it's flipped between n and sine theta. The subscripts are flipped. Right, water's on top, here air is on top. The refractive index of water we're just calling n, and the refractive index of air is just one, so I'm just gonna put n on the left side. Sine of theta air. What's the angle of the ray while in air? That's easy. It's phi, Brewster's angle. And what about the denominator? What's the angle of the ray, the refracted ray, in the water? The angle it makes with normal is 90 minus phi. Like that. You may remember from what pre-calculus, calculus, that the denominator there, sine of 90 minus an angle, is equal to cosine of the angle. And that's kind of easy to see if you look at a unit circle, right? If you have some angle here, 90 minus the angle would be this. The sine of the original angle would be this value. The sine of n the cosine of 90 minus the angle would be this. And this red length here is equal to that green length. So yes, in fact, from here to here, we are correct. We have done something legal. The sine of 90 minus an angle is equal to cosine of the angle. You also might remember that sine of an angle over cosine of an angle is equal to tangent of the angle. So n is equal to tan phi. If you take the inverse tangent of both sides, you get 
phi is equal to inverse tan of n. And that's what we set out to prove. What's so special about this angle phi? Well, it's the angle at which all of the ref uh, at the angle at which the reflected and refracted rays are perpendicular. But there's something else special about the angle. Let's imagine that the incoming light is unpolarized. Because the incoming light is unpolarized, what we can say is it's made up of equal parts that are horizontally, whoops, vertically polarized and ver uh, horizontally polarized. That's one of the ways we can conceptualize or think about unpolarized light. At this angle phi, at this special angle phi, the reflected beam contains entirely horizontally polarized light. What's reflected? The polarization plane, which is parallel to the surface. The surface is horizontal, and the reflected light is horizontal in polarization. What about the refracted angle, uh, the refracted ray? All that there is besides the horizontal light, the horizontally polarized, is the vertically polarized light, like this. So at Brewster's angle, phi, all of the reflection, or the reflection entirely contains horizontally polarized light. So let's put that down as well. At Brewster's angle, the reflected light is completely horizontally polarized. Polarized. Good. What if we come back to the original picture? Okay. What happens to the polarization here? We have equal parts, horizontal and vertical, in the unpolarized light. If we're not quite at Brewster's angle, then what happens is most of the reflection, wait, that's wrong, most of the reflection is horizontally polarized but it does have some small vertically polarized component. It's there, but it's small. And most of the refraction, the refracted ray, most of it is vertically polarized, but a little bit is horizontally polarized. And over on the right side, the same sort of thing is true. We start out with unpolarized light, the reflection is mostly horizontally polari polarized, but it still does have a little bit of vertical, uh, vertically polarized light, or a component is still vertically polarized. And most of the reflection is vertical in polarization, but a little tiny bit is horizontally polarized. So let's say that you're on that water surface. I'll put it in blue. You're on that water surface, and you're looking for fish below because you're fishing. But you can't see the fish because every time you look at the water, you have this reflection of the sun, this glare, shining in your eyes. Here's the sun incident light. It reflects, and that reflection is making it hard for you to see and look at the water. You're really clever. What do you do? You buy polarized sunglasses. Polarized sunglasses have a transmission axis, which is vertical. They only pass through vertical light, so that reflection of the sun, that horizontally polarized reflection, doesn't make it through your glasses, and you don't see the glare, which allows you to see the fishes, little fishies, swimming below and then put them in your frying pan for dinner. <laughs>